Isn't it wonderful this administration says, if you got good credit and you have a down payment, let's just make sure you pay more interest on your loan. What a, what a jackhead freaking move that was. And because we need to help out those. You ask our dads, like, dude, people are locked into two and a half, three percent rates. And everybody's like, oh, the rates are terrible. That's a huge opportunity because, yeah, rates are terrible. So those sellers know that they're sitting on gold, but they don't know how to use it because I can just take over your mortgage. Oh, well, there's still $100,000 left between what I want and what the mortgage is. How does somebody research? To find those with low interest is just knowing people, or is there, a, is there is there a database somewhere you can find out? Is it and then and what's your approach to some of them when you find out that opportunity? Just to be safe, but 2020 for sure, right? When rates were crazy low, but 2019 they were still pretty low. Service members have such a leg up, they, and they just they don't it. know it. <laughs> like, how many yeah. people leave the military and go, oh shit, I gotta make all this money just to make to live the life I was living in freaking the barracks. <laughs> What's cracking, everybody? Mighty smart guy, Matt Zapala here. He lives here from Frisco, Texas, right here at the formation. Go figure a couple of jarheads here. Uh, thinking that it's a football formation. No, we're like thinking this is like a military formation. I'm here with Devil Dog extraordinary, extraordinary author, David Pere. And uh, very proud of you. Did, uh, did his service in the United States Marine Corps. And now today, he is a millionaire author and actually doing it. And also... <laughs> running probably the largest veteran Facebook group for 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 wealth creation with uh, fifty thousand plus. Right? Yeah. I think that there's one other Facebook group that's uh, up there, but as far as the rest of the community, we dwarf them drastically. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, very we're, cool, man. Uh, so, so Dave, let's let's get into it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't not do that. <laughs> why, why not? Why not? <laughs> so, uh, so, so, Dave, what 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 inspired you to say, you know what? I'm going to be an entrepreneur because it's not a normal thing for veterans to become entrepreneurs. It's usually become a cop, firefighter, <laughs> postal worker, contractor. You decided to become an entrepreneur in real estate. Yep. It's funny. It, it wasn't, it wasn't really like a inspiration thing. Um, someone handed me rich dad, poor dad. And I was like, oh, cool. Changed my life too, man. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, another oh, devil dog. Oh, house. This sounds cool. Let me buy a duplex and try this out. And so I lived in one side. I rented the other side. And when I, got orders to Hawaii. I was like, uh, you know, I was like, well, this is, this works. Like this property is paying me now that I don't live in it anymore. And this is proof of concept. This is a really cool thing. Uh, but I never like anticipated it being anything more than like a couple rental properties that I would just kind of own and it would supplement whatever. And I would retire from the Marine Corps and that would be it. And in 2018, I was thinking about writing a book not like this. I was going to write a book about Afghanistan because uh, I had like a, I still do a journal and like a mission log. And so I was like, all these seals write all these books, but there's no book about like the normal, like Lance Corporal Motor T guy yeah. and like all the boring yeah. crap. But like we did some cool stuff, but like. So it's only the operators and the yeah. special forces. Guy, right? I was like, you know, there's, <laughs> you know, like I got some funny stories. I was like, there's no book like that. I want to write that book. And so I asked my buddy, and he's like, dude, if you want to get into writing, like, you should start a blog. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I don't know what to write about. What should I, you know, I have no idea what that looks like. And he he recommended that I write. He's like, dude, you're, you're buying houses. You're in the military. Just, I don't know, just make a blog about, like, being a military real estate investor. What year was this? Uh, 2018. And, and what year were you in your career? I would, 2018, I would have been a decade into being in the Marine Corps. I'm kidding. Yeah. So a sergeant, staff sergeant, what was your... Uh, to 18, I would have been, that would have been the year I got promoted to staff sergeant. Staff nice. Yeah. Okay. So I would have been sergeant, probably got promoted to staff sergeant six months later. And I had, uh, so the month that I started the blog, there's actually a video that is the second video I ever posted to YouTube. And that month is when I closed my 10 unit apartment, which was the second investment property I bought. And so I really didn't have, like, I was Nick, the new guy no clue what the hell I was doing. Uh, and I'm just like documenting like, oh, today, like some of the first articles I wrote are like, this is how you use Google's advanced search features to get better <laughs> answers to questions. <laughs> but it's totally, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing. But then over time, as I started writing more, people just kind of, it was like, I'd start getting like very similar questions, you know, and I'd go, oh, wow. You know, four people asked me this question about the VA loan. Let me go research it and write an article about it. And that just kind of started being the norm. And then all of a sudden it was like, 
people are coming here to answer questions and that very quickly around 28 late 2019 early 2020 i kind of it kind of went from a dave is screwing around answering some questions here and there to almost a responsibility of like oh crap i need to like actually take this seriously yeah. people are coming here for answers and i'm becoming the guy and i don't feel like i know all the things i should probably become the guy and uh, well that's a neat, neat thing which you were saying there because when you chose to lead uh, you know, a Marine Corps lesson I learned. Uh, I mean, I, I only did eight years. You did, uh, I mean, 13, 13 years. Yeah. And so when, when, I mean, when I was in Lance Cooley and Corporal, I learned right away hip pocket training. It's a Marine Corps lesson. Hip, it was, yep. You know, don't just be standing around. You better be training your Marines <laughs> on something that you just picked up, right? Yeah. That same principle you see going down into investment. So a lot of parallels we have in the Marine Corps, some of the things we just normally are programmed with are very unique things and allow us to be teachers and leaders in for Civ Biv. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it just, you know, I remember distinctly when everything kind of like started to take off and it was, it was probably April, May of 2020. And it was like the Facebook group went from a hundred people a week, my request to join in to a hundred a day. And then like a month later it was 200 a day, 300 a day. And all of a sudden I was like, it got to the point where I was like, I can't work. I can't go through this many requests. I can't keep up with it. Wow. On a, a Facebook group. Yeah. I, I was like, at one point, there were probably like two or 3,000 people pending, <sighs> approving them into the group. And it got so overwhelming that I remember going in one day and going, approve all. And <laughs> going, I'll just block them when I realize they're yeah. bots. I hope this works out. And then like, I was like, oh my God, I've got to bring in a VA or somebody to help. And so like, I started like asking friends, like, please help me with this. And, yeah. Uh, and now we've got like 15 or 20 moderators and I have like an actual intern who runs yeah. the Facebook group for that. And yeah, you know, I did all of the stuff wrong at the beginning, but it was crazy. Uh, what was your purpose? What was your outcome for running a Facebook group? Initially, it was just because someone told me, hey, you should probably have a Facebook group if you're doing this stuff. Like that way, if you just sharing, ask questions and, yeah. and then, and then, yeah, you know what I've realized though, is that, uh, the Facebook group, like, you know, every platform has their own personality and they're all very unique and very different. Uh, and I would say that like one person in a Facebook group is probably worse. Like in my head, one person in a Facebook group is the equivalent of like two people or three people in a YouTube channel or an Instagram follower. But probably the equivalent of like 20 or 40 people who follow you on TikTok. Um, like, cause in the Facebook group, they, yeah, there's a gauge question. Yeah. They'll respond to polls. They'll, yeah. you can ask them <laughs> questions. Like they give you feedback. They, there's engagement. Yeah. And that group we've maintained no less than 70% engagement month over wow. month in that group, but we've averaged 85 or 90% engagement in that group for the entire time it's been around. It's crazy. It's nuts. We're still growing it like 2% gotcha. per month. Uh, we've had, yeah, I mean, we're still growing it like twelve to 1,500 people a month right now. <laughs> What's the uh, etiquette that you would expect for somebody to be part of that group? What's some of the conduct that you like to see somebody to be uh, a, f a contributing member, not just a give, not just a taker, but also a giver of, of, your, of your Facebook group? Yeah, I mean, mainly just giving, right? I, you know, I expect people, if they're in the group, you know, the intent of the group is not to sell. It's just to foster information, provide value. Now, obviously people are going to do business within the group and I'm all for that. I'm not here to create some monopoly. I, in fact, I don't, I do a terrible job of monetizing. I mean, the best monetization that I do within the group is essentially like some referrals or affiliate stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't really sell much in there. Uh, if I do, it's like, if someone asks me, Hey Dave, can I buy your book? And I'm like, Oh yeah. Uh, here's a link. You know, <laughs> not very well marketed. Like I have a mastermind group and most of the people in the group don't even know it exists because I don't push it in there. Interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. It's kind of, I just, I don't want it to feel salesy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, I would say the main etiquette is like, you know, let's say you're, uh, well, you're, you're in the insurance space. So like someone posts a question about insurance and there's inevitably what happens is like 40 people will comment. And a lot of times I will see the comment of like, I DM'd you and I will immediately block that person because my assumption is like, well, if they just shot him an shot him a unsolicited okay. message, 
there's probably no value there. It's an instant pitch and they probably don't know what they're talking about because if they did, they would have publicly shared it, publicly shared the information. Yeah. But then there's probably going to be five people who say, I give a really well thought out detailed answer and don't ask for anything in return. And those are realistically going to be the people who actually get the business. Mm. And those people will stay in the group all day long. Mm. And so like, I just kind of figure, you know, the genuine people will, will just answer questions, help out, whatever. And they're going to end up getting this. I mean, there's like, for example, uh, there's a lender that I have never referred business to that does tons of business in the group. There's a CPA that I've never referred business to that does, couldn't handle more business this year because of the amount of volume that he does within the group. Uh, not just my group, but a lot of it comes from my group. Uh, and we've talked on multiple occasions uh, and the reason for both of those and the reason that I allow them both to remain in the group is because they never post their link. They never ask people to message them. They just answer questions really well thought out and people reach out to them and say, Hey, you know, I appreciate it. You know, can we jump on a call? Which is, I think the right way to, okay. you know, transactions just makes that, sense, right? You know, it's makes sense. Uh, so that's, I, that's just kind of my style, right? Because I'm, I'm in, I'm in a bunch of uh, insurance groups. Well, cool. And, and sometimes, you know, somebody has to flex, like I'm the insurance guru. I'm about, like, bro, you've been in the insurance business for 12 months. They're talking about your insurance guru. And, uh, I understand infinite banking better than everybody. Great. Show me a policy with more than 10 years of, <laughs> of, uh, of cash value building. Bro, you just got involved in the insurance business. So they're flexing because they're trying to get the business. I get it. Uh, but brother, master, sister, master your craft, right? Master your craft and what? Learn, learn along the way. And I think if you're good enough, when you show value, people are going to sense that and they're going to naturally Absolutely. want to gravitate your way to as well. Absolutely. And, and that's the, the thing that I think scares me the most, right? Is like, you've been in the group for a long time and, and I've never seen you do anything that would say anything other than just add value. Uh, and, and that's the way that anyone who's good at what they do operates because the people who are like sharks in the water. <laughs> it's because they don't actually have a role in it. You know, they don't have word of mouth. They don't have, they're desperate for business. They reek of it because of that. And so it's like, why would I want you soliciting for business when clearly you're not really good at what you're doing? Mm. Otherwise you wouldn't need the business. Yeah. Well, CPA adds all that value and he can't handle more clients. Right now. <laughs> That's the guy I want answering he's, questions. He's a veteran. He's a veteran. Look, and yeah. Now, now, David, when I, when I was in and I told my guys I'm not re-enlisting, <laughs> I got a bunch of shit. You know, I'm like, yo, bro, the only thing you know how to do is Marine. What do you know about finance? What do you know about insurance? What do you know about financial services? Bro, didn't you just file for bankruptcy? Didn't you just get a divorce and blah, 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 right? And so to to the veteran or the, the, the brother or sister that's still in uniform and they have some aspirations about going in business for themselves, you know, what, what guidance would you would you give them if business, if finance, if real estate is a direction they want to go in in terms of just staying focused in on that, on that transition? I think probably the most important thing is just to have your foundation laid out, right? You know, I saw, and this kind of goes back to like the intent behind stuff, and I'm not going to name drop, but you can go to my YouTube channel and you can find the video. I, I did one of those stupid reaction videos to somebody the other day. And I saw this video, super disingenuous, where uh, another veteran community was making a video about, they, they pitched it as like the greatest, one of the awesome benefits of the VA loan, which don't get me wrong, like it's cool that you can do this, but you can do it with any loan. The benefit was being able to co-sign. And so they pitched like this awesome benefit is that if you have no money, no like crappy income and no credit, that you can convince a friend or a family member to co-sign so you can still use your VA loan. And I'm like, <laughs> you're just trying to sell loans because what you're doing is you're basically trying to get this knucklehead who has no right, no reason to buy a house right now yeah. to give you a commission check by convincing their mom, dad, sister, or bestie yeah. to basically hope that they don't ruin their own finances down the road. It's like, if there's nothing wrong with renting a house yep. while you fix your own finances. And you can actually rent a house and still make bank. I mean, I rented a house in San Diego for two years where I Airbnb'd two yeah. bedrooms and I came out of pocket 
on average 400 bucks a month to live in a brand new build four bed three and a half bath with a pool around the corner wow. you know so yeah. like um yeah i mean the first the first three four years of my, my were like getting out i was renting for a while and then um i found another house in a neighborhood i want my kids to go to school and to go to and i rented there too as well because i didn't have you know i was like how do i get my va stuff together i have credit created my VA loans and i could even if i get va approval it's gonna be a, a crappy rate so I, I pitched the guy a rent to own type of scenario. So if I can if I can pay you you know a couple hundred bucks actually above rent, but give you ten G's up front, and then to, to lock in and exercise the the lease to own, would you consider selling at this price, uh, agreed upon before it, it explodes? Yeah. Uh, uh, Twelve to twenty four months later, he said, "Sure, no, no problems." He was a he was a lawyer, so that's one of my first ways to do it. And uh, I mean, into your into your testament, you know, I. I used my BA loan here buying this house in Frisco. I mean, you love this area, right? I mean, it's a crazy area, right? <laughs> this is my first time driving around. Nice. <laughs> and so we're, we live we live right here, and, and down the street is Zeke Elliott's house, and running back for the, the Cowboys. It's right down the right down the street from me. Multiple Super Bowl champions live in my neighborhood. All because in the meantime, I was building my business, building my revenue, and now the VA loans got no got no limit. And so the bank, the investors like, okay, you got the cash flow. It's str- you're strong enough to support. Here's your here's your shopping money. Knock yourself out. Like, my wife's like, are you sure we can get that type of house? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but we busted our tail while renting. In the meantime, yeah, yeah. So I would, yeah, I would just tell people, you know, get your, get your finances in order, and then don't be afraid to bet on yourself. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. it, whether and there's so many ways to do that, right? I mean, you can you can go the route of just being really dang good at sales and finding something that makes sense to sell insurance, real estate, loans. Like there's so many products that you can, yeah. if you get good at sales and you get good at networking, you can crush it in so many industries. But then the other approach is just find something you're really freaking passionate about. And really you can build a business around pretty much anything. Yeah. If you're passionate enough about it. Yeah. And I think if you, you know, if you can get your finances in order and just, like have enough to live on and then be willing to bet on yourself no matter what that looks like. Yep. It could be all right in the long run. My man. So let's talk about 2023. Isn't it wonderful this administration says, if you got good credit and you have a down payment, let's just make sure you pay more interest on your loan. What a, <laughs> what a jackhead freaking move that was. And because we need to help out those who don't have as good credit. So we're going to take your interest rate and, and give it to them. I don't know what the hell, I mean, what's your reaction to that? Well, you know what's awesome about it is how politicized that's become. But you know what's really cool is that that doesn't matter to us. <laughs> yeah, right. So it doesn't, that's only Fannie Freddie. It's not Ginny. So it doesn't apply to FA or to FHA, VA, or USDA at all. Nothing no, Conforming, non conforming loans. Gotcha. Yeah, only conventional. Didn't change at all for Got federal it. bad loans. Wow. So, which is nice because when I first saw all this stuff going crazy, I was like, well, this is stupid. And then I talked to one of my buddies. He's like, yeah, well, it's stupid, but it's also like being super mass mislabeled. Yep. And uh, so I made a video like just yesterday where I, my hook was proof that Biden loves veterans more than nasty civilians. <laughs> it's totally not true. And total, like at the end, I even had to be like, all right, I never politicized anything. So obviously that hook was just a hook. I'm not going there, but I got it. it worked because you're still watching. <laughs> um, so, so FHA, it's still three and a half, three and a half percent down, right? Yeah. So, but, so we're just going to pay, if it's going to apply to that, it's going to be a higher interest rate. So, so, oh no, the, the interest rate. So that's what I'm saying. So like nothing, nothing changed for, for the loan level pricing adjustments for, for any of the Ginny May backed uh, mortgage products. So those are all the same. Uh, so it only changed for conventional loans. My understanding is that the reason behind it is not necessarily because of like a punishment or a, you know, subs- whatever, subsidizing. It's more or less because, and I didn't dig as much into the like why, but what my, the buddy that I'm referring to is, is like, one of the smartest mortgage lenders that I know and runs like a training company on all this stuff. My understanding from speaking with him is essentially that Fannie Freddie is trying to prepare for the coming, you know, recession potential, and they're trying to bolster essentially reserves and, yeah. and fees. Yeah. And the fastest way to do that is to up the fees that they receive from transactions from the biggest buyers buyer pool. And their biggest buyer pool is that best credit, good credit, seven forty twenty percent down mark. And so that's what 
they took the biggest fee hit on here. Um, so does it make sense? No. Uh, but ironically, it's, it's like, it's kind of funny because it's like, well, if you go as 5% down with a 740 or it doesn't really matter if you go 40% down, it doesn't really matter. It's just, if you get that 20%, so it's kind of, yeah. and so I've got some friends who are joking about like, buy my course and I'll teach you how to tank your credit in two months. <laughs> <laughs> so you can save money on, on your mortgage. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Don't be stupid. We ain't <laughs> so qualified. So with that being said, what are some opportunities? What's some opportunities you're looking at? What's some opportunities you're excited about in, in 2023? in spite of high inflation, in spite of high interest rate, in spite of, you know, potential, another pandemic, um, in spite of the crisis that we're in, what are you excited about this year? The next, like I'd say next 12, 18, 24 months. Yeah. I, st I still think that, so every, everybody's been worried about, you know, so I, I guess we should just, we'll, we'll lead with this. And obviously I'm predicting from, you know, my like, blind leading the blind nobody knows what the heck's going to happen but i don't think real estate will be the leading domino um i think real estate if there's a big time crash real estate will you know obviously suffer but everybody's looking to real estate like what's going to be the domino that causes everything to crash and i can't see it being the real estate market i i can see it being jobs especially with like the tech industry laying off i mean Google, Amazon, you know, they've had some massive layoffs. I can see it being the auto industry because they've got sure. crazy, like, yeah. I mean, they've, the markups over the last two, I mean, there's crazy stuff there. I see restaurants and food service. Yeah, restaurants and food service, consumer debt on credit cards and stuff is crazy right now. Uh, all of those things um, I can see. But the reason I can't see the industry, the real estate market, amongst other things, there's all kinds of weird things, but the main one is because the, vast majority of homeowners right now locked in 30 year fixed mm -hmm. under four percent but yeah. mostly under three and they're not adjusting just like they were in 07 08 09 they're not, they're not adjusting rates they're like the safest debt you could possibly have yeah and so you know if you're if you're thinking through like from a risk perspective like what's possible what you know so when you think through like opportunities well when we're talking through the high fees and the the loan level pricing adjustment thing that just came out that we just went through, um, well, those loans are like the their goal. So these people have equity; they have a locked low interest rate yeah. with twenty five to thirty years still on it. So I'm thinking, assuming like assuming mortgages, purchasing houses subject to the existing mortgage where you just take over their monthly payment, seller financing transactions. I mean, there are, you know, the, the rent to own, the lease option. I mean, there's the wraparound mortgage. There's six, seven, eight ways that you can purchase a house with the existing mortgage still intact. Ooh, by the way, we got that's some juice. You got, you got to talk to us about that. Yeah. Okay, so, but we can see that thought. <sighs> oh, yeah. yeah. There's, I mean, so subject to, right, is literally just saying, hey, uh, I like your mortgage. I'm going to buy your house. And uh, basically what's going to happen is we're going to sign these papers and you're going to give me the login access to your bank and I'm going to make your payments. And that's it. Like basically you're essentially giving me a power of attorney. Sure. And I'm just going to give take over, change the password to your account and I'm going to make your mortgage payment. And that's it. And like nothing changes. Like, and there's the totally legit, totally legal. You sign some papers with the attorney and like, what, ben, what type of transaction? If I'm going to go to attorney draft those papers, what would it be? Subject to is what it's called. They call it sub two, but it's, it's literally just uh, basically purchasing and it's called, uh, the line is subject to the existing mortgage. And just another version of seller finance. Type, type. Yeah. So it's essentially, you're basically just buying and saying, I'm taking over his payments, but you're not assuming the loan. Cause so the, the trick I think is with, cause you can assume a mortgage. But the tricky thing is that when you assume a mortgage and just take over, like you actually put your name on the mortgage and replace the buyer or the original, the seller, uh, in most of those scenarios, you have to occupy the home. Not the end of the world, but with the subject to, you can do it all day with rentals. Wow. And so, and then, and then the other tricky, the other interesting thing from like a risk perspective, which I actually don't like, 
Uh, I just, just cause I don't like kind of that it leaves the seller in the dark. Um, but like if you defaulted on that mortgage payment, it goes back to the seller. The, the investor is like, whoops, right. I wasn't on the loan. Cause I was just paying your payment. It yeah. was on my credit. Yeah. So like from an investor perspective, it's like super low risk, which seller perspective you doesn't necessarily sit well with me. But. <laughs> You've got to really trust that person who's going to... Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, you put a down payment on it, you take over the monthly payments. But if, again, if you're locked into this super low yeah. debt and it cash flows, who cares? What's another way? What's another way um, I can buy a house with somebody? Seller financing, okay. obviously, is, yeah. you know, I love seller financing. I'm What's the best way for you to, for you to do it? There's, well, seller, the beautiful thing with seller financing is that there are so many variables that you can flex with. I have a buddy in Austin who just bought a house off the MLS like last year and he bought it 5% interest. I think he put 20% down or maybe 10% down, but he bought it on the MLS. He offered like 10 or 15,000 over asking price and he did a 40 year amortization because he was like, Hey, if I do this, 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 and this, and I just do a 40 year amortization, <laughs> the numbers make sense for me. So are you cool with that? And I'll just do a, I'll balloon it out in 10 years. So at the 10 year mark, I'll have to refinance or pay you off in the Seller was like, I'm going to get $10,000 more than my asking price right now? Done. Look. Yeah. So, you know, that was off the MLS and, you know, at a time where, well, people were saying, oh, you can't do seller financing on the MLS right now. The market's too hot. And so my buddy pulled it off. Uh, but creative financing is- You never know until you ask, right? Absolutely. I've done a ton of creative, like, seller financing deals. Uh, in fact, up until- Actually, I don't think I've ever put 20% down on a house and I've bought a ton. I mean, I've either had creative financing or, I mean, almost every deal I've had, I've ever bought has had yeah. some kind of creative something in it. But then I also have a lender who does 50% uh, down on everything. So, yeah. Got it. Um, so there's, there's that. There's also a wraparound where you can do, let's say you owe 70,000 on a house and I'm going to buy it from, a, for, from you for a hundred. Uh, I could do a hundred thousand dollar seller finance at 5% interest and I just pay you that note and then you pocket that and you just have to pay the mortgage. So whatever the, so you would make the, the 30,000 at 5% interest. And then if your $70,000 note was at 3% interest, you would get to pocket the 2% difference on that 70 that I'm paying you. So it's like you arbitrage that piece and there's all kinds of like tricky. Wow, um, it's a masterclass right there. Yeah, it gets it gets super. Uh, like I need like a chart, you know, yeah. and like draw numbers. It's like an ebook for you, man. Yeah, this lots next of book. powerpoints and stuff yeah. on it for sure. I've done some presentations, but uh, but I mean, those are the things that I love because it's like you ask right now, it's like do people are locked into two and a half, three percent rates, and everybody's like, oh, the rates are terrible. That's a huge opportunity because yeah, rates are terrible. So those sellers know that they're sitting on gold, but they don't know how to use it. If you understand how to have that conversation, you go say, hey, nobody wants to buy your house because they can't afford to buy your house at the price you want. But I can, because I can just take over your mortgage. Oh, well, there's still $100,000 left between what I want and what the mortgage is. Okay, you're right. So I'll pay you that 100,000 over the next 20 years at 5% interest. Oh, okay, done. Yeah. There it is. Whoop, there it is. I love it. I love it. So, so what's your approach? So how do you, so what I was thinking to myself is number one, how does somebody research to find those with low interest? Is it just knowing people or is there, a, there's a, is there a database somewhere you can find out? Is it, and then, and what's your approach to somebody when you find out that opportunity? You know what I would be doing right now is I would be, I would look for homes that were purchased I would probably go 2019 just to be safe, but 2020 for sure, right? When rates were crazy low. But 2019, they were still pretty low. Even 2017, I mean, rates weren't above 4% from like 2015. They were all 4% or less. But if you hit 2020, for sure, you're going to get low. But even 2015 on any of that, you're going to be under 4%. Um, okay. But if you look at, well, because, yeah, because people did a refi. So you you'd probably want to see if you could pull data on originated loans 2020 or newer uh with owner occupied mortgage so you go to the title company, houses so for that, uh, for yeah you could you could do title company you could do owner occupied mortgages that were originated within 2020 or newer 
or uh, you know, there's a website like PropStream, which I use, but you could also just go MLS and just see homes that were purchased, yeah, 2015 or newer, where the owner lives in the house. So you have to be a realtor to be able to, to have access to uh, MLS. D- depending on where you live, there's there's some systems you can you can okay. get access to that okay. stuff, yeah. Um, but but title company can give you yeah. sure. I mean, for nominal price, it, depending on who you talk to, you can get it for free. I mean, cool. I mean, most of this stuff is public record. It's just you got to be. Just getting a, you know, it's like anything, right? You didn't bring in a coffee, some cookies. And you your lunch break, uh, had sweet. throw them a bone. I'll tell you this. I, I had a, a buddy, I'm going to rephrase that, a former employee, <laughs> former 1099 contractor, I'm not even going to use the word employee, um, guy who, when he left the company, he, st- he exported all my leads uh-huh. to himself. Oh, damn. Yeah. And so we signed a letter yeah. that said basically like, hey, any transaction you do over the next 12 months, if it's on this list of people. And so the deal was like over the next 12 months, any property that he purchased that was either an address or an owner on that list, he would have to abide by the original uh, commission split. So like basically he would have to give me the majority share as if he had still been an employee. And so I reached out to him that annual, April 15th was the, the date. So I reached out to him. I was like, hey, I just need a list of whatever you transacted over the last year. Crickets. I knew it was going to be crickets, but I wanted to send that email because- Yeah, back to me. You know, yeah. and it was kind of fun to send that email. <laughs> Let's be real. It's subtle, like, screw you. <laughs> but it was a super professional email, but it's also sure. like an email that I know was not fun to open. Um, total crickets. But I just shot an email to the title company. It was just like, hey, uh, can you pull this for me? And I had it two hours later. So I have a really good relationship with the title company that I work with, Kane, and the guy that I do all the business with was like, yeah, here's everything. And I just highlighted the properties that were actually under that person's name in LLC. And then tomorrow I'll just sit down with the lead list and just, you know, control F, just (laughs) check everything. And it's only, it was kind of disappointing. It was only 14 transactions. So I don't know if it'll match up, but. So that's what you're excited about in 2023, shelter finance opportunities. I think that's a huge opportunity. Yeah. I mean, there's a ton of other stuff out there, right? I mean, there's, I think on the residential side, I mean, there's, I think RV parks and I think like self storage and I think uh, mobile home parks are all asset classes that are probably under, uh, I don't want to say underutilized, but just uh, have some opportunities. Okay. Uh, I, we bought an RV park last year that we've probably doubled the gross rents on in just the first year. And, I think, I think self-storage is, you know, as it, so the weird thing with these ones is like mobile home bars, generally speaking, uh, communities don't like them, so they don't want to develop new ones. <laughs> and so, you know, you're kind of stuck with what you got, but when a procession hits, people generally downsize. And so mobile home bars don't have an occupancy issue. If anything, they fill up. Yeah. Because that's the most affordable place that most people can end up. And then, well, as people downsize, self-storage is going to fill up as well yeah. because they put stuff in storage. Yeah. So both of those asset classes traditionally do better mm-hmm. in a recessionary market. And then RV parks, not normally a recessionary type market, but in 2020, 2021, 2022, we saw a massive influx in RV buyers and the millennials and their like home, you know, tiny home thing and they're like man life thing. And yeah. so, I mean, I've got a few friends. The fire movie here by the fire movie. Financial independent. Oh, fire early. Yeah. yeah, I've got some friends who are they're like minimalists, mm, right? And they love it. Yeah. And I've got some friends who've traveled around in RVs. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and so I've got a few friends who own RV. I've got a buddy who lives up in Sherman and uh, he's got a $6 million RV park development going on for now and he is super bullish on it. And so who knows, you know, I, I like, I like some of that stuff. Yeah. You know, uh, let's talk about some of the, cause I'm in the insurance, I'm in the yeah. insurance space. And, uh, it's, it's so funny, by the way, the last from 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, all you heard on TikToks and reels and financial type of channels was crypto, 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 oh. whatever crypto it was. <laughs> and, I, and I always, I always say, because I've been through multiple recessions already, 01 dot-com bubble, 07, 09 great recession. The value and principle and lessons I learned from those recessions is when money starts, when liquidity starts peeling back and a recession starts to get hit, 
fake money and fake strategies and fake gurus get exposed. And look at Sam Mackin Freed, FTX, <laughs> NFTs. Uh, you can pick your you can pick your crypto. Uh, but what has replaced a financial talk has been insurance, because insurance is always going to be stable. It's always going to be stable, wow. right? And so they get drowned out by the noise when a hot you know investment opportunity comes up. And even though insurance has always been there, but now that a lot of things has peeled back, insurance now has taken a spot. And I, I run Salesforce over 3,000 agents across the country. What's some of the things that turn you off about how life insurance strategies are promoted on blind? If it is. You know, it, it's funny because I think it could basically be summed up as the things that turn me off about life insurance is when people try to make it sexy. <laughs> because what you're alluding to is exactly the same thing as in almost every investment strategy, right? We talked about it a minute ago. You're like, you're only a huge fan of day trading. No, I like index funds and I like buy and hold value investing in stocks. Not a huge fan of house flipping. I mean, it works. You're right. But I would much prefer to have a house that I just hold on to for- Yeah, buy and hold guy. Yeah. Um, not a huge fan of like- You're a wholesale guy? You know, I had a wholesale company for about two years with, with the intent of I would wholesale two properties to keep my marketing budget alive so that I could renovate and hold a third or fourth. But even that was, it was such an actively involved business that after about a year and a half, two years, I sold it to a friend who's crushing it. He's making six figures a month right now. Um, and he's doing very well, but I sold it to a friend and the way that I sold it was, Hey, I'm going to sell this to you. I want 10% of the net proceeds for the next three years. And I want first right of refusal on one deal a month. So I still got my cool. deal a month. I want nothing for the first, like nothing at sale, but I don't want to have to actually do the market. So every cool. month I get whatever deals he lands, I get to say, hey, I want that one. Cool. I'll have to do it with that. If you found the right operator, the one in the and he's crushing it. Um, and he lives in Medellin and he's living in Colombia. Life and, and, and he loves it. Uh, he's had himself a, you know, a Novia and, <laughs> and so, uh, life's good for him, but, but to answer your question, right? So like insurance is one of those things that I don't, I don't know is it not to like insult insurance, but like, I don't know that insurance is meant to be sexy. It like, it's like uh, a lawyer. It's like, like cement. How do you make cement sexy? Yeah. It's like a steel bead, right? Like <laughs> I don't want my attorney to be sexy. I want my attorney to cover my ass. I want. I, you know, I mean, it don't, and I'm sure like insurance can and is, and I'm, there are wonderful reps out there who do a great job of articulating things. But the moment that something that is supposed to be a, Hey dude, this is not, it's like safety. Mm. Nobody wants the safety dude around until something goes wrong. And then you're like, Oh crap, we should have had that guy around. I don't want like the insurance guy that's like, look at how amazing it all is. Like you want all these flashy things, like something seems off, you know? So, you know, the thing that gets me is when we talk whole life, Steve, it is from, there are a million different ways to use it. And there's strategies that fit all kinds of walks of life, right? Like if you can get whole life and you are way more knowledgeable about this than I am. And there's strategies for in fact, we probably need to talk about strategies for, you know, young kids, forged generational wealth pitch. That scope, I don't necessarily understand and I know I'm missing an opportunity on. Um, but when I usually think through it and hear about it, it's revolving on young service members who don't have the capital to overfund, you know, uh, yeah, you're an E1, E2, E3. <laughs> yeah. So the reality is they're being pitched on, you're going to be able to get this policy, put money in. And what they usually end up hearing is like, you're going to immediately be able to pull Take it, it out of the savings account. And it's like, no, you probably won't be able to do it for seven, eight years. Yes. Yep. You're going to, yes. you're going to earn, earn a return on it while your capital is deployed. But the person who's telling them that doesn't actually know if that's true because they don't even understand the difference between the two different types of policies, you know, and they're saying things like, yeah, you're going to have this massive death benefit and also this mass cash value. It's like, well, which is it? Cause yeah. they're, it's, you, you can't structure that way. <laughs> exactly. Right. And, and that's right. the other thing that drives me nuts is every insurance rep I've ever heard in my group when I start calling them out on stuff goes, well, it's just cause that person doesn't know how to structure it. Every single one of you says that nobody else knows how <laughs> to structure it. So what, like who does then? Yeah. 
Um, so my, my biggest thing, I guess, is really just it's like it makes sense to me for the people who've already accumulated a little bit of wealth and, you know, can afford to put some capital in and they're in the like cash preservation or saving or what we were talking about where it's like you got to hide some cash from from risk or uh, or in a recessionary, you've got capital you need to um, like there's a lot of reasons that it absolutely makes sense but most of them start with the premise of having money and so i where i get jaded is when it's like you don't have money and it's pitched as a get rich quick yeah. like accelerator yeah, it's horrible and it's like well actually the opportunity cost of losing that seven six seven eight years before you're going to be able to really tap into that money again mm. is not helping that person yeah yeah so, yeah well off. It's it's one thing to try to overfund it, but if you don't have much to overfund it, it doesn't make financial sense. You know, the, the fancy terminology is again closer to the modified endowment contract, you know, the the seven pay guidelines. You know, what whatever the IRS allows you to maximum fund a policy based on the death benefit it's on the policy. If you can't get close to that and you just try to put in what we call minimum premium to the policy, just just say it's a minimum premium policy. That's just something to get started. I mean the, the thing is, the biggest financial gaining asset that we have is time. Yeah. And the biggest thing an E1, uh, Lance Cooley, a young corporal, a young sergeant can do, a young private first class, is as they see out in base, you can get a car for 33% interest. <laughs> right. I, the most I've ever seen on paper is 27, but I have seen that. Yeah. But so they understand how interest works in their favor over two, three, four years. You know the, the 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 military service member needs to understand how that could work in their favor, awesome. not 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 for somebody else, but that money work for you in your favor. So, getting started early, sooner, like, because help me understand what was your what was your TAPS class like? Because here's how my TAPS class sounded in 2003. All right, you get ready for the civilian world, get ready to be out of your uniform. Oh, by the way, take this financial planning class because compound interest can work in your favor. I'm like, oh, by the way, get your VGLI. Because you know your SGLI is gonna be over with, but in one of my staff sergeants he goes, well, pretty soon you got to pay two fifty just to get two fifty, because the VGLI is so damn expensive. Just to say VGLI is like, <laughs> if you look at the prices on that, I mean, I for, I can't remember what it is. I have it in my book somewhere, but it, isn't it like it goes to like it's like oh, it's like fifty bucks, a hundred bucks, okay. two grand a month. Yeah. Four, I mean, it, it's like it's all very yeah. expensive, so. Fast. It's it's annu it's what we call annual renewable term. It's just it's just a, it makes sense to do it, <laughs> and and so so in other words, my question to you is: Did you get that same financial planning class leaving the Marine Corps, which we should have got in boot camp or at least your first duty station, yeah. when, when you got in and you tapped out? So I got. I mean, I'm sure it, I'm sure it's probably been changed a little bit, but yeah, I got I got not <laughs> not the best class by any means no which is which is part of why i you know talk about what i talk yeah. about right because it's like yeah the benefits are the information's out there yeah but you know the military is not in the business of trying to create people who don't need a job right it's not that they want to keep the man down it's just that like i think they you know that they, they make the resources available but they're not going to like sit you down and force it down your throat and um, be like you need financial freedom so you can quit like probably not in their best interest right but well i think it's a massively important subject because you know you, you, you and i were leaders of marines and i remember when i was going through divorce and i was going through my 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 financial pitfall that was the only thing that was on my mind and yet we gotta we gotta do missions yeah you gotta make sure you know your, your job is done everything's calibrated you know, and, and if your mind ain't if your mind ain't there, and I think at that age too as well, you don't know how to deal with a heartbreak. Yeah, you're 18, 19, 20 years old. You're, you just got your heart broken. You, what you just stood for from a financial standpoint just got ripped out from under you. It's not like you've been around for ten years and had the, the mental maturity of a 26, 28, 30 year old man, let alone the experience to do it. So, you know, what, what are your thoughts on the financial morale of of service members? Yeah, you know, there's that. Definitely a lot of things that we could do better. I mean, the thing, like one of the things that drives me the most nuts is hearing like the whole, we don't get paid enough. Like the, like, it's just, people don't know how to read their leave and earning statement. Right. And so they think they make no money. 
service members have such a leg up they, and they just they don't say. know it. <laughs> like how many yeah. people leave the military and go, oh shit. I got to make all this money just to make to live the life I was living <laughs> in freaking the barracks. <laughs> it's, it's like, man, you join the military and most people had no debt when they joined. But if they did, you know, the service member civil relief act drops your interest rate to 6% on anything like hat, you know, yeah. mandated. And so like, you basically join the military with borderline financial freedom. Yeah. You know, like your housing's paid for, your food paid for, your and all this, whatever. Yeah, your your food's paid for, your your housing's paid for, your medical's paid for. Oh my gosh. Dental's that's a big one for me. Oh, it's huge. Medical and, and dental. Yeah. Especially when you're a young idiot like we were, and I, I got hurt all the time. And whether I went to medical or not, but you know, and you, you can eat the chow hall, you could yeah. I mean you could literally go your whole four years, not even buy a car. You could save, you could invest your, almost your entire paycheck. Yeah. You know, I mean, you could, you could walk to most duty stations. You live close enough. You could walk to your, huh? your get work. Get a bike. Yeah. You get a bike. You can walk to your in Okinawa. I mean, yeah. I, I was over there. I didn't have, yeah. I walked everywhere in Okinawa. When I went to Pendleton, I, I carpooled with people for a while. I had a Harley then, but whatever. <laughs> um, but I mean, like. Yeah, I used to tell people, I'm like, dude, you don't even need a vehicle to like go out with the buddies. Like you can DD for your friends. Not that everyone wants to do that, but if you DD for your friends, like, yeah, you know, you, you get all the fun stories. You get to drive all their cool cars and you don't have to pay for them. You know, um, you can, if you're smart, like I, there's a, there's a guy I had on my podcast, his name's Jabbar Adesada and he purchased his first duplex as a single barracks Marine. He was a Lance Corporal when he went under contract, bought it picked up corporal his command signed off on him buying it even though he didn't have bah he was a barracks marine he he managed to get wow. approved for the loan and he's still in the mar barracks and so he bought it moved into one half and like you know whatever and dude's got i think three houses now and like an airbnb and like still doesn't even have bah he's got permanently uh pristine barracks room rated for inspection yeah <laughs> he's got dusted yep. down and, and yep it's so, great as I wrap up, David, uh, if you can give me your top five stupid military mistakes yeah. that will keep you from becoming a millionaire, because you know there's so many great things about the military that you can financially set yourself up for success. But if you were to if you were to give if you were to brainstorm, yeah, I don't know, three, four, five, whatever, that that derails a brother and sister in uniform for life after the military that gets them financially set back versus maximizing the time that we're in. What would you say that, what would you say that would be? Yeah. Uh, the first one's, you know, debt right off the bat. I mean, not that, I mean, let me rephrase that bad debt, right? I love debt, but <laughs> the I, bad debt, man. Yeah, I got $5 million. Debt. So the depreciation, most, most of my debt is wonderful, <laughs> and, um, you know, but, but bad debt. Yeah. Debt, debt on credit cards and vehicles and, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I should preface as vehicles that don't make you money and credit cards that aren't on things that are near you, like any kind of debt that's losing you money or on depreciating assets. Right. Sure. Um, I, not educating yourself. And I don't mean college. Don't get me wrong. College is whatever. It's great. If you have a super unique skill set for a job that you actually want to do that you're going for, but. I mean, you know, educating yourself, reading, reading a book or listening to a podcast or learning a specific skill set like sales or copywriting or building a funnel or, you know, whatever that might be, digital marketing, something super tangible for today's world. Uh, so I'd say if you're wasting time, not learning, waste, I mean, you're sitting around, you know, hurry up and wait. How much time do we sit around in our butt, right? You got a phone, learn something. Um, you so, you know, debt, not learning, negativity, right? Unfortunately, people seem to get kind of sucked up in the like, just negative, yeah. like, why did I do this? Yeah. The military, blah, blah, blah. This is stupid. Like, nah, man, and enjoy it. Like, there was a lot of bullshit that goes on in the military, but it was some of the best times of my life. I loved it. I remember the Corporal McComb in my last unit. And uh, he was corporal. He's like an eight-year, nine-year corporal. Like, bro, what did you do wrong? Right? Yeah. But, but as soon as, as soon as he got done, you know, I, I was I was in I was in helicopters. I was on frogs when frogs were still around. And um, as soon as he got done being a mech on frogs, boom, go right to his base housing. 
working everybody's cars, making a couple hundred bucks here, oil changes here. Da, 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 da. He had a home. So he's making money on evenings and weekends and he was just stacking cash. And then when I came across a financial problem, the first person asking who to help me bail out because I got some stuff to sell was that guy. <laughs> and he bought stuff for me at 20, 30% discount because <laughs> that was the bad spot. But more parts. So while everybody was being negative, he was out being productive. That's funny. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, that's probably it. I think that those are the, the biggest pitfalls other than just, you know, getting in with the wrong people and just being, not being willing to bet on yourself. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, there's, I, I'm sure as I think through it, there's a million other other things, but the biggest ones are just not being willing to learn, mm -hmm. being closed minded, taking on debt that you don't need, yeah. and not investing. Right. I think what one that sticks out to me because I went through it was getting married to the wrong woman. I got back from a deployment. What? Yeah, you know, because you're lonely and, you know, you kind of felt that kind of way. And it's like, oh, if I can have you at home every time I come home and ball, ah. <laughs> and then, and then, and then the Marines would be pissed off because they end up marrying a stripper. <laughs> you know, everybody knows her as Candy, but she know, he knows her as, you know, uh, Lisa. <laughs> she, he brings her to the base and everybody's like, oh, no, I, I know your wife. <laughs> And then he's all heartbroken and she's like laughing because she's got free health care and, and dental and all that stuff. So well, that's true. Yeah. Who you, who you marry. I mean, and it, you know, we talked about it before recording, it doesn't even have to be like this. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's, there's definitely something powerful to it, like incredible uplifting, but even just avoiding the woman that is or the spouse to each and say woman, uh, because you might be the woman and you're marrying a man or, yeah. or whatever other Vice versa, yeah. relationship <laughs> triangle that exists these days. God forbid, I'm not going to go through the 5,000 combinations that there are these days, but you know, whatever, yeah. you know what I'm getting at. Yeah. Um, if the person that you're marrying is bringing, you know, a crap load of debt to the relationship or just negative baggage or mm -hmm. like you just need to make sure the person that you're marrying is at least a net zero and it's not a positive well Dave before I let you go man uh, give us a reason why people should buy your book if there, there's people out there looking for uh, references and resources I mean, I, I, lo I love the title of your book man so <laughs> why buy yes God to military life yeah so it's just everything that I wish I'd known when I first joined the military right so if you're thinking about joining the military or you are in the military or veteran, right? It's, it talks a ton about the BA loan and stuff, but it's everything I wish I'd known when I first joined. And honestly, they don't even need to buy it. If they just go to uh, my website. They can download the PDF for free if they... Personally, I hate the idea of reading PDF books, but if you can stomach that, we can have it for free. Uh, the one that I'm really stoked about, though, is the planner, which is brand new. Uh, yeah, I, I've been journaling for like four or five years now. And I've gone through four or five different types of planners and I finally just got fed up and was like, I'm going to take the best pieces of all of these and make my own. And, uh, it's the first planner I've ever seen that actually starts the day at 4 AM. Cause I was like, no one else accounts for the fact that we're nut jobs. So, <laughs> and I've had a, a number of people text me and be like, oh, thank God. Finally, like one that starts when I wake up. Yeah. Yes. Thing goes. So yeah. Uh, yeah. But well, Dave, I appreciate you, uh, visiting with me while you're here in Dallas. Oh, my. And uh, we're going to smoke some cigars. We are going to smoke some cigars. I'm glad we finally got to meet in person. Sure. Absolutely, man. Yeah. And you make sure you follow David here. We're going to put all his stuff here and the links below, right here in the lower third. You can find him on Instagram. You can find him on YouTube. Make sure you pick up his book. And by the way, brother, I love that shirt. Military millionaire. If you want to become a first generation cash flow millionaire, make sure you follow David. And also make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Your thoughts, your questions, your comments, put it in the comment section below. We want to know what you're thinking. So therefore, we can help you think like a millionaire, strategize like a millionaire. So therefore, you can become a first-generation cash flow millionaire. For Frisco, Texas, on behalf of David and I, I'm a mighty smart guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart. Continue to love smart and be mighty smart today. Bye-bye.